So Laura, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Amy. Happy to be here. Oh, glad to have you. So Laura, I wanted you specifically to be on this podcast because you have a unique story story to share, which I think other women should hear as well. So why don't you start from the beginning and share with us um, way back to the start where you were diagnosed with cancer? Yeah. So I, um, so I was having some issues and, um, I thought they were related to the fact that I was going through menopause. So I was super, um, like, Oh my God, I'm, you know, I think I was gosh, 56 at the time. And I was like, finally it is hitting. Like, I'm so tired of this, like just ready for it. And so I finally reached out to my gynecologist and I live in Florida and um, I couldn't wean myself from my gynecologist in Chicago. So I called her up in Chicago and I kind of told her some of the things that were going on. And so she was like, "Hmm, this doesn't seem right. Let's get you in for some blood work. So I went for blood work first. And the CA number was big as compared to what it should be. I think it was in the three or four hundreds. So she obviously was very concerned about that. And um, so then I, she sent me for ultrasound and um, the ultrasound showed that there was a big mass. And uh, the really kind of strange thing is that I had seen her that, uh, so this was in December and I had up to uh, 2020 and I had seen her that February because I had surgery the um, November prior to, and I had, you know, follow up ultrasounds, nothing showed up on the ultrasounds. So somewhere between like, I feel like February and December, this tumor just blew blew up. And so it's clearly showed that it was, um, you know, on the ultrasound that there was a big, huge tumor there. So I flew up to Chicago to see her and I, um, she did a um, biopsy and I had an MRI. And so, um, and then as I was getting ready to leave Chicago on Christmas Eve to come back home to Florida, you know, she called me and said that it was, um, it was definitely, you know, confirmed diagnosis of um, ovarian cancer and that they also had found some cancer in my uh, endometrial lining, which I wasn't totally surprised about that because that had always been a concern of ours. Um, And so I was being watched by her pretty closely, like going up there every six months. And and, um, I had a couple of procedures or whatever. So anyway, we weren't super surprised about that, but the ovarian shocked me. I have no, you know, again, like so many people say, like, I felt I was very fit. I'm very active. Um, I'm not running marathons or doing CrossFit or anything like that, but, you know, golfing, um, working out classes and that kind of stuff. And what year was this in? Like when you were diagnosed? Uh, so I, so I got um, diagnosed, the confirmation was, I guess, you know, 2020. Uh, and then um, I had a consultation with the head of gynecological um, uh, oncology up at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago mm-hmm. two weeks later. So she got me in to see him pretty quickly, which was awesome. Right. And um, so I was, um, so I got the confirmation, the diagnosis on Christmas Eve from her, um, oh, 2020. And then in 2021, uh, two weeks later, three weeks later, I had surgery. Wow. So I was scheduled for surgery and I had a total hyst- uh, hysterectomy. Going into surgery, they told me it was probably going to be about a four hour surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were going to, the doctor said we're going to take everything, but they were all pretty co- uh, confident. The surgeon and um, my gynecologist that the tumor was not attached to anything. And they were pretty confident that it was going to be early stage, maybe two, one, maybe two. Well, I woke up from surgery seven hours later. And that wasn't the case. It was, um, the, the tumor was, um, uh, was, uh, attached, you know, kind of holding on to some tissue and they had, um, did some biopsies of the lymph nodes. Luckily the lymph nodes were all clear, but there was, they did find some cells in the omentum. I never even knew what that was before. (laughs) And so, um, and it was kind of interesting. So they ended up admitting me to the hospital, which was never the plan because the surgery was so long. And then, um, my doctor, um, again, COVID's going on. So they thought my doctor, my surgeon, after he did my surgery, he had gotten the COVID vaccine. So he wasn't allowed to come in. So I never saw him again right after the surgery. So he literally called me on the phone to confirm the diagnosis. And I hadn't heard from him a a couple of days. So we were living in a hotel in Chicago, my husband and I. And so I got a call from my gynecologist who I've been seeing her for, you know, 30 something years. And she was like, I'm so sorry about your diagnosis. And at that point I hadn't even heard from my surgeon. And I was like, what? And so, I mean, 
even though they had kind of told me that it was ovarian cancer, I think I was still kind of in disbelief, disbelief of it all. Yeah. And then of course, on top of it, I get diagnosed with a really rare, rare form of ovarian cancer. Yeah. So um, never knew that there were so many different types of ovarian mm-hmm. cancer. Um, and then to find out that it's this um, rare form called um, meniscus something, MOC, which I still can't even pronounce it. And um, which is very resistant to chemo treatments. It's uh, super rare. The, um, you know, the uh, you know when I saw the surgeon after my uh, my uh, follow up after the um, surgery, he was kind of like, you know, when you start talking about prognosis, and they don't like to talk about prognosis. And I think I was still in denial a lot. And COVID was yeah. going on, and so you couldn't. I couldn't bring my husband into these appointments with me. He had to oh. sit out in the waiting room, so I'm there all by myself. And um, so finally I just burst out crying and they were like, let's go get her husband and bring the husband in. But um, (laughs) it's just like, so it's so awful, isn't it? To be like, make like women, people go through this solo when like, Mm -hmm. gosh, just like what we know now, especially like COVID and Mm -hmm. I mean, to have, they were like your husband. Yeah. I mean, they, they're like, we can have your husband on the cell phone. And I was like, that's not, you know, yeah, great. You just need that second set of ears or whatever, but sure. that, I just need that person next to me. Yeah. And so, um, so that was, and then when you asked him about the diagnosis and my mom gave me a list of questions, like my mom mm-hmm. was all over the internet scouring things. And I, I learned to like stay off the internet mm-hmm. and, you know, so she's like giving me a list of questions to ask. So I was like, okay, doctor, my mom wants me to ask these questions. So, <laughs> um, we kind of right. went through it, but my big thing was like, okay, what do we need to do? And like, what's the outlook look like. So and what did your staging like, end up being, Laura? Like what did they end up so, staging you as? So they staged me for the ovarian. I think it was 3B, okay. I want to say. Okay. And um, because it was in the omentum, a little bit was in the omentum. And then they, um, on the endometrial cancer, it was stage one, I think. Okay. A. So okay. that was, I, nobody ever really talks about that cancer. So, okay. um, but it's on all my paperwork. So, yeah. um, and that's so with insurances. So, so they really- focused on treating you for ovarian cancer then for the ovarian cancer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And with the MOC ovarian, there's not, because there's not, um, there's, it's so rare. There's, they haven't been able to do a lot of studies because they don't have a lot of patients that have it. Um, all they really know is that it's resistance resistant to, um, chemo treatments right. and what the typical, um, ovar- like treatment plan for ovarian cancer is. So when I talked to the surgeon in Chicago, he was like, I go, okay, so what's the prognosis? And he was like, well, if we can get you to one year, that'll be good. And mm-hmm. then um, if we get you year, to year one, then we just really need to get you year two. And then we'll just kind of see. Wow. And I was like, okay. And um, so I was in my mind, I was like, this is a great hospital. Um, you know, this doctor just, you know, got all the cancer out of me. Um, and I have to be in Chicago to have my chemo. My husband and I, you know, cause the doctor's like, you need chemo and you probably need radiation too. Okay. So the chemo for the ovarian cancer and the radiation for the, um, the radiation for the endometrial cancer. And I was okay. like, okay. And I told my husband, I'm like, we're having it here and we're doing it in Chicago. And he was like, it's winter time. We have a home in Florida. We live in Florida. Like, and I was like, no, but you know, my parents have friends. So we had a place to stay. All my friends are there. I have family up there too. And I was like, no, I really think I need it in Chicago. And he was like, but your parents live in Florida. And I was like, okay, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And so he was just like, um, so anyway, the doctor was like, let me see if I can find you somebody that's close to your house. So he ended up finding me uh, two people. And um, so he called the two doctors on my behalf and one doctor didn't know to really respond to him. And the other doctor, I went and met with him and I absolutely, um, you know, adore this doctor. He seemed Mm. very smart. He seemed caring. He just seemed like to get, he kind of got it. And I liked the fact too, you know, they were kind of like chemo's chemo. Like it's not really different in Chicago than the chemo than in Florida. And, um, you know, Florida has this reputation. Um, you know, most people, if you can, you want to get out of Florida, if you have medical issues going on, Mm -hmm. at least that's been our experience in the area that we live in. Mm -hmm. Um, My husband had been diagnosed the year before with cancer. And, you know, his, one of his other doctors was like, get out of Florida. Like you need to find somebody who specializes in this. And it's not really in Florida, even though there's, you would think that they would have a lot of people, but anyway, so I, um, so I just really fell in love with this doctor and, um, and, but then he kind of changed up he was like, okay. And he's, and he's consulting with the guy in Chicago. So I felt great. good about that too. Okay. So I kind of feel like I have these two great minds kind of helping yeah. 
Um, so anyway, the treatment, so um, the doctor down here though was like, we're not gonna worry about that creature cancer. Like, we're just gonna really worry about the ovarian because you had a total hysterectomy. There's really nothing there. And you know, if you're gonna do chemo for ovarian, it's not like it's gonna bypass anything that was going on in the, sure. you know, in the endometrial cell. So I was like, that makes sense. So we, I never did radiation. So I did six months of chemo. And then I did, along with the six months of chemo, I did six months of Avastin. And then they had me do another 12 months of Avastin once my chemo's done and kind of did that alone. And, um, and the protocol that they had me on for the chemo. So the Avastin really is for women that have, my understanding, for women that have ovarian cancer. So that's a typical ovarian treatment. But the chemo cocktail that I was on was more geared towards people that have um, people that more people that have uh, colorectal cancer yeah. or colon cancer. Yeah. So it was, um, and it was IVs and pills and it was every three okay. weeks Okay, and it was horrible. Like it is okay. for everybody else. Okay. So with uh -huh. the chemo that you had chemo, no radiation, big surgery. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. what was like the main thing that you were kind of struggling with after you finished chemo? Like you go through the six months of intensive chemo and then yeah. left feeling like what? Then I was kind of like, after the chemo got done, I mean, I was still kind of doing the investment. You see the doctor, you have all the blood work, you know, you're, you know, freaking out of, you know, when you go in for the blood tests and then you get the results and, you know, if it's a little movement in the wrong direction, I'm crying and emotional and calling the doctor. Absolutely. And then when it goes the other way, you're just like, okay, few, but why isn't it zero? Cause it's, it's never been single digit. Like that CA number, mm -hmm. um, the CEA number, I never freaked out about as much, but, um, and then kind of after that, you're like, I'm still doing the, um, the ovarian, but then you're like, okay, what do I do next? Like, yeah. you kind of feel like a little bit lost because when, and I was saying this earlier tonight, like you have a plan, the doctors put you on a plan. Like, you know, you have your surgery before you're going to start chemo, you know, you're going to get, you're going to have a colonoscopy, you're going to have a mammogram, you're going to, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to do all this blood work, get another CT scan, that all that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. then you're going to start chemo and then you do the chemo and you go blood work, you know, before the chemo, then you do the chemo treatment. I ended up in the hospital during chemo for a week. And then when that gets all done, then you're like, okay, now what? you know, and it's, yeah. so you kind of feel a little bit lost. And yeah. uh, again, with my background in playing sports, it's kind of like, you always just need, like, I need a plan. Yeah. You know, um, I, I hadn't been working and, um, you know, I was trying to d debate too, like, should I go back to work or not go back yeah. to work? Especially and, Laura, because um, they're like, let's take you to year one and then year mm -hmm. two, if we can. So now, mm -hmm. so, so now what do you do with your, with life? Right. And then you're like, too, like, Oh my gosh, if he's only taught like the prognosis, which they say don't look at, it's not great. Um, so like, okay, now I'm two years, like I've hit two years now. Mm -hmm. So does that mean I only have three years left? And like what what, you know, do I want to be working? But I kind of have to work for, you know, um, because I carry the insurance for my husband and I. And so, you know, and you and you can't not, not have insurance. You know, my yeah. husband's like, just quit your job, we'll figure it out. I'm like, oh, I can't live like that. I can't mm. live in that mindset because we both mm. need insurance really bad. Mm. You know, I'm still going through chemo treatments or any immunotherapy treatments. Like I can't live like that. Like I need yeah. a plan. Mm -hmm. I'm a person that needs a plan. You mm -hmm. know, people are like, you know, my brother started his own company. Why don't you go work for your brother? Oh no, no, no. I need a company and I need yeah. a plan, you yeah. know? So that's kind of yeah. how, I know, think a lot of women like, feel like that too, with like such a, mm -hmm. such a, like the gravity of your diagnosis. And then, you know, yes, you want to go live your life. But it's not to say like, you're not getting fulfillment from your work. Like, of course you are, mm -hmm. but like, right. gosh, yeah, it's tough because I mean, at this point, especially like, I hear this from stage four breast cancer survivors too, mm -hmm. you know, like they, they end up like, they get this terrible prognosis and they're like, Hey, I'm actually here. I'm still here. I'm still here. You know? So what do I do now that someone's basically mm -hmm. told me I am on death's door, but yet three, four, five years later, here I am. Right. Yeah. And, well, I haven't gotten to three yet, but I'm hoping to get there. But, you know, and yeah. also too, it's like, I never, um, you know, I was blessed in terms of like, I didn't lose my hair. I, I did lose weight, which I was like, why am I not losing weight? Like I, I didn't have a lot of the side effects that a lot of women go through. Um, I was ready for it. Like I chopped my hair down super short. I went and got a wig. 
Um, but you know, on the flip side though, too, it's like, you want, you know, everyone's like, you don't look like you're sick. I can't tell you how many people, if I had a dollar for every time, everybody, you know, said that to me, like, you don't look sick. You don't look like you have cancer. I'm like, but I do. I go every three weeks. Yeah. I get, I'm getting these injections and for yeah. a week I'm flat on my bed and in a lot of pain. Yeah. You know, but yeah, you know, other than that, um, so that kind of makes it too, cause everyone, you know, I almost felt like sometimes people, and I don't think they meant it maliciously. I think they were trying to compliment you, but it's like, do you think I'm online about cancer? Cause you know, I'm not, mm. you know, type of thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, that was kind of difficult. So I just, like, I just needed a plan. I needed like to do something or kind of, you know, I wanted to lose some weight. I just feel like you're on, you're just kind of on this chemo roller coaster or whatever. And then you kind of get off it. And then, you know, I, after I got done with the chemo, the doctor's like, okay, we're just going to continue the Avastin just to, you know, just to give you that little extra yeah. something, yeah. which I was like, absolutely sign me up for it. But then I was like, what else should I be doing? Yeah. You know, and he was like, just go out and live your life, enjoy life. And I was like, okay, I'm not sure I can do that. Like it took me a while to do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, to yeah. like kind of give yourself permission for that. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So Laura, when we cross paths, mm-hmm. you um, were kind of in that space where you were looking for next steps of what to do next. Yeah. I mean, I had been, I somehow came across it. I think when you start to like, I didn't join a lot of support groups. Um, but you know, you, I followed, um, a couple, you know, so, um, ovarian cancer sites on Instagram. Some of them you get inspiration from some of them are kind of depressing, exactly. quite honestly. And, mm-hmm. um, and I just, you, you showed up in one of my feeds or just kind of popped up. And I just, I was like, so I watched you for a while and your emails and your Instagrams. And I was like, oh my God, like, I love your energy. I was like, you know, I also too felt a little bit of a kinship thinking like, okay, this is somebody that's had ovarian cancer as yes. well too. Yeah. Stage um, three. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like same stage, mm-hmm. stage three or whatever. Yeah. And so I watched for a while, like I have to watch and observe. I'm kind of like yeah. that person at a party until you get to really know people. Ah. Like I'm in the back. I like to observe. Okay. Um, and so I kind of did that for a while and, you know, mm-hmm. I read your emails and then, um, and finally I just was kind of like, you know, I was like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm going to, I got to lose weight. You know, did that stop me from eating a pint of ice cream every two days? No. You know, was I losing any weight? No. Yeah. Um, I did a little bit of walking, but not really. Um, you know, I part of me was kind of like, I don't, you know, I feel like I can't, like I was worried about doing more, which Mm -hmm. I probably could have a lot sooner than I was. Um, and again, I still adore my doctor, but I feel like at the doctors, it's kind of like you get done with the treatment and then they kind of send you off your way. And I felt like with you, I was like, oh my gosh, like this is somebody who's kind of, who is not kind of, but who's been through what I've been through Mm -hmm. and has a plan. And I, I want to have a plan. So, um, I remember signing up for your class. I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to do it. And then the hurricane Ian hit Ah, and I was like, I can't join. I'm like, I was so embarrassed because I never like not to show up to something that at least I'm like, oh my God, Dr. Amy's going to think I'm totally blowing this off. No. So I think I sent you an email like there's a hurricane coming. I'll hopefully I'll catch you the next time. Oh yeah. And then um, I think there was another opportunity like a week or so later. And so yeah. I um, did it and I, um, and then you and I talked afterwards and I was like, yeah, this is what I need. Yeah. Like, this is just what I need. So, so what um, gave you the push, you know, cause Laura, a lot of women are at that place where they're done treatment. They know mm-hmm. that there's certain things that they probably should be targeting in terms of mm-hmm. reducing their risk of recurrence. Mm-hmm. But I, what I hear from a lot of women is that they'll say, you know, I just don't have the motivation. Like I'm beat up. I'm tired. So for yeah. you, like what pushed you over the edge to actually like take action against, yeah. Um, yeah. like, or to get a plan? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm tired. Um, well, a couple of things. I'm t- I was tired of being tired first and foremost. Mm-hmm. So that was a big, huge thing. Like I had never, um, you know, when I had low energy before, I just chalked it up to the chemo and to the, um, and to the immunotherapy treatments. And that probably was it for a while. But then after I, the farther I got away from it, kind of like I had neuropathy is one of my side effects. Like the farther I got away from my chemo, the little, the better I got a little bit over time. And, but that wasn't happening with the fatigue. So I was super tired. I had the hot flashes, but I don't complain about those too much. And then the, uh, the other big thing for me was like losing weight. Like I'm tired. I'm at the heaviest I've ever been. I have clothes that I can't fit into. Clearly what I was doing or trying to do on my own wasn't working. Uh, my mom said to me a couple of times, like, why don't you do Weight Watchers with me? Cause that's what, that's her thing. And I yeah. was like, no, 
You know, that's not, uh, you know, after like sitting in on your class and I was talking to my parents about it. And again, she brought up going to Weight Watchers and I was like, mom, like that's good for you. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this program will be good for me because it targets like the whole yeah. point of the program is to target people that have been through cancer. Like I have, Yeah, I know she doesn't forget that, but like, you know, mm -hmm. that's the difference between you and me. Like you go do your thing because that works for you, but I need to find somebody and the community, like the other part of it too, I think for me was the community of it. Cause I didn't really have that, um, you know, um, with the, you know, the doctors or the, you know, the group or where I did my um, chemo treatments and stuff like that. Everybody was wonderful, but there wasn't really a big sense of community. There was things that you could sign up for, but it just didn't really fit for me. So I just decided like enough is enough. Like I got to, I got to feel better and I got to lose weight. Yeah. Like I got to feel more energy and I got to lose weight. And clearly what I was doing was not working. Yeah. And again, I mean, like I said, I just felt like I just had that connection. Like this is going to be, this is what I need. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that about your mom and Weight Watchers. And it, it's what a lot of us do, right? Like we mm -hmm. want to lose weight after chemo. So we naturally mm -hmm. go to the things that have worked in the past to lose weight. Mm -hmm. you know, but the trouble is, is like your body is changed. Like you're changed. Right. And so the mm -hmm. approach we take now has got to be different than what we took for your body before cancer. And, and yeah. that offers to it. I think Weight Watchers is a wonderful program for general, like for women mm -hmm. in general, but I don't, right. think it's going to work for cancer survivors. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I had never, some of the concepts that you brought up, like those things are so foreign to me, like macros and, mm -hmm. you know, your, the plate approach and, you know, and like protein, 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 mm -hmm. like, um, you know, those things were all things I never thought about. And for mo majority of my life, I have, I had the opposite problem. Like I was too skinny. I needed mm -hmm. to gain weight. Um, I struggled with it for right. in my teens and that mm. kind of stuff. And um, so like to kind of go the opposite extreme and be like, oh my God, now you gotta, you know, you, yeah, I want to lose weight um, and get fit back into all these fabulous clothes that I have, wow. like, and feel more like myself, like going back to work was a little part that made me feel a little bit more like back to kind of my old way, even though it's, it's going to be an old new, yeah. you know, type of thing. Yeah. Right. So, exactly. um, you know, and, okay, so, and again, to the sense of community too. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So tell us like a little bit, well, I want to talk about the low energy, but then I also want to talk about the weight. So you said mm -hmm. you're having trouble with energy and you were just tired of being tired. So mm -hmm. what really made the difference in terms of your energy? Like, what is it that we did that really changed things for you in terms of your energy? Oh my God. I mean, I don't really know, but it worked. Like, um, I mean, I was tired of telling like people would be like, how are you feeling? I'm tired. Like, you know, I don't want to do that. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And, um, after being in the program, you know, a couple of weeks, I wasn't, I, I found myself like not saying that I found myself saying yes to doing more things that I was doing before. So, you know, I don't know, like I never drank so much water in my life as I'm drinking right now, but that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I never focused on protein before, which is a huge part of your program, which uh, clearly that it has something to do with it, yeah. you know, and I think like the exercise, the exercise piece of it, mm -hmm. um, has something to do with it, you know, and watching your videos, like, you know, I heard you say over and over again, like, you know, exercise will reduce your risk of reoccurrence by 59% or 58%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I heard it all the time, but I wasn't doing it. And I think yeah. the accountability that you bring into it is really, I think has been so incredibly helpful and beneficial. Cause I think when you have to answer to like, you know, my husband can say like, oh, you should go work out. And I could be like, oh yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm not doing that. Yeah. But I feel like, like when I signed up for this and I committed to it, I was like, okay, I got to be all in. So That's how everyone is right. Like my husband mm -hmm. would say, that to me, say it to me. He'll be like, you working right. out this morning. And I was like, get out of here. Like, leave me alone. Uh -huh. I'll do it right. when I want, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. that's just what we're all like. We need someone that's really objective. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. and say like, Hey, why didn't like, why didn't you get this done? Call or, you like, out. This is the next yeah. step, right? This is waiting for you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So that's the energy piece. So where are yep. you at now in terms of energy? Like you said, you're saying yes, more to things that you can do. Is there anything that you're like not doing now because you don't have enough energy? No, I can't think of anything like, um, you know, I'm back, uh, well, I've been golfing and mm. I feel like I can play 18 holes Ooh. and not be, not be exhausted at the end of it and tell my friends, like, I can't, you know, I'm done at hole 16 or whatever. So that's been huge. I actually last week played two days in a row. That was wow. a bit much, but it's the first time I've done that 
in a couple of years. So I feel like that was a big win. Wow. Um, you know, I'm tr- I've tried uh, pickleball, which mm-hmm. was kind of a big deal because I was really nervous about my movement, like side to side and back and forth. Uh-huh. Cause I haven't done, I haven't done that. I've never played pickleball before, but, um, you know, I've talked to a couple people about like playing tennis. So I have done that before. And I, uh, when I was younger and in my prior life, so, you know, I kind of feel like I'd like to get back to that. So I've talked to people about maybe giving that a try. Nice. Um, so yeah, like just kind of, um, pushing myself to try challenge myself to do some different things. Yeah. yeah I love that. Mm-hmm. I love that. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yeah. Let's talk about the weight aspect. Cause you said you want to drop mm-hmm. weight when you came into the program. So right. where are you at in terms of, um, dropping the weight and getting to kind of a weight that you're more comfortable at? Yeah, I think I'm about halfway to my goal that you okay. and I set when okay. we started. Nice. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously I wish it was more, mm. you know, but you told me I needed to be patient with that. So, yeah. um, you know, I can do that, but, Love um, it. yeah, I mean, I think too, again, it's just kind of learning. Um, it's made me more aware of like food choices, which I kind of was a little bit more, uh, before, um, but now it's like just more like awareness in terms mm-hmm. of like what you choose to eat again, to making sure like with the whole protein thing and the macros, which again, I never really, you know, I I'd seen it, but I never, um, I find myself following some dietitians on um, Instagram that talk about macros, um, yeah. but more so just to get like ideas of like yeah. things to eat, Yeah, you know, totally. um, to kind of, cause I'm still kind of, I do struggle sometimes like trying to find some different things that I like, Mm. um, you know, so I think just to get some different, um, inspiration from some different people. So I think that's been like super, um, opening, um, to me. And obviously it seems to be working. Like, I don't know, you know, this, well, how much weight have you lost, Laura? Are you, are you okay with sharing that with us? Yeah, I've lost about 10 pounds, nine okay. pounds. Okay. Um, we'll see what this week brings, but okay. uh, cause I know we changed some things. So I'm down, like I said, half, my goal was to lose 20 pounds. Okay. Um, and you know, I'm halfway there. So yeah. I'm happy with that. And I'm and we've gone through clothes. like Christmas and New Year's and traveling yes. and traveling all these things. And yeah. yeah. And you know, everybody's flying south to the, or coming down south. So there's, we've had a lot of visitors lately uh, too. So some struggles there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I mean that I'm at, I'm pleased because I'm getting into some clothes that I haven't been able to get into mm-hmm. and I'm close on some other ones. Mm-hmm. So I'm super happy about that. And I decided mm-hmm. I can't buy anything more because I don't know what size I'm going to be in. Like I feel uh, like I'm moving, moving into different sizes. Yeah, so nice. my husband tells me to shop in my closet. <laughs> no, yeah, that's not as much fun. Mm-hmm. Okay. No, no, no. I love no. that. Mm-hmm. I love it. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Laura, you've been so generous sh- sharing your story with us. I really like, I really just have one last question for you okay. here. You know, if we were, and I want to speak like specifically about ovarian cancer survivors too. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of what you have said here has resonated with my experience as an ovarian cancer survivor as well. You know, like feeling that it's like a little bit depressing to be in some of those groups because you just don't see women that look like you or Mm -hmm. hear about recurrences. It can just be, I find as an ovarian cancer survivor, it can be particularly lonely um, because there's Mm -hmm. just not a lot of us around sometimes. And right. So yeah. Unfortunately. Someone, yeah. Unfortunately. Right. And so mm-hmm. for someone, if you were to think about someone that's just diagnosed with ovarian cancer, what would be like your main piece of advice to them? Like, what's the main thing that you would want to share with them? Oh my gosh. I don't know if this is going to be enlightening or not, but like, don't read the stuff on the internet. hmm Um, and, um, you know, there are some sites out there that are really good and positive and uplifting. So you just kind of have to weed out the other ones, but, you know, I think, um, you just always, um, sometimes when your mind starts to go to that dark place, you just kind of have to switch that, uh, flip that switch, if you will, and keep it positive, Mm -hmm. you know, keep it light. Um, you can't, you know, you can't get through it. There are survivors out there. Um, I've talked to some of them. I, you know, as you start to talk to people and you'll hear like, oh, my mom had it, you know, was diagnosed 11, 12 years ago and she's still alive. So I just hold on to those stories, you know, as something um, positive. And I just, you know, when you start to kind of go into that bad place, then I just kind of reflect back on that. And that's kind of, that's been super helpful to me because, you know, there, you hear a lot about breast cancer and some other cancers and all the fundraising and everything that goes into it. And you see a lot and it's true. And I was guilty of this myself. I think probably before I got diagnosed, nobody ever really talks about ovarian cancer, some of the other 
um, women camp cancers, there's always been the focus on breasts, which there's nothing wrong with that. They're going through their, you know, their, um, their thing, if you will. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, you know, there, I wish there was more light, more research, more um, treatments for people with ovarian cancer. And yeah. hopefully that will come. Um, you know, if I do have a reoccurrence, hopefully we're a long way yeah. to getting there by the time yeah. I have that. Yeah. So. Agreed. Agreed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's mm -hmm. a story that like, I, I don't know if I ever, ever even shared it, but when I was diagnosed shortly thereafter, I was giving a speech, um, kind of at mm -hmm. an event and a lady came up to me afterwards, um, who was like this little old lady, you know, mm -hmm. and she was like, I just want you to know that like, I was diagnosed with ovarian cancer when I was your age. And I'm oh my kind of, like a little emotional even thinking about it, but I was just like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, like, thank you for coming and talking to me. Like, yeah. you just need like, that one that's person. what I'm going to remember. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's so powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, Laura, thank you so much for sharing your story and thanks for being here with us. All right. Thanks so much, Dr. Amy. Appreciate you.